Well, I'm going to actually maybe before we go on to the next section, um, I wanted to try and capture what we just looked at already. So we uh, we had the walkthrough with the the snakes and adders example. Um, unfortunately, I think we ended up rushing it a little bit too much to the end for me to drive some of my points home. But we um, we actually broke some of the rules in that, and I'm going to cover some of that in this section. So I want to talk a bit about uh, what makes a good test. In fact, let's, yeah, let's get straight into that. That's probably the best way. Th this is the material I sort of threw together this afternoon, by the way. That's why I'm thinking about how to present it as we speak. Um, don't worry, it'll be fine. So what actually makes a, a good test? Let's have a look at uh, starting with an example. Take a really simple example, a function that just adds two numbers together. Obviously, it's trivial. You wouldn't actually write this, probably. Um, just uh, the simplest thing I can think of. So the first thing to note here, and again, this is using catch, so it wouldn't look exactly like this in another framework, but that name, we didn't write a name in the uh, the walkthrough that we just did. If we did, we'd write it as a free form string like this. Now other test frameworks, most of them, you would have to write it as a, a C++ identifier. So it limits your options a bit. You can't use spaces and punctuation and symbols. Um, you have to use a camel case or snake case or something. But th the main principle still applies. And that is that a test should have a good name. And it's really easy to overlook this. It's, it's one of those things where when you're actually writing it, because you know what it is you're writing at the time, you don't really think about how best to name it. You just want to get on and, and write the code. But it turns out when you sit down and think, well, how do I name this test? You'll often find it's really hard. And the reason it's hard is because you haven't really fully got in your head what the requirements are, what it is you're trying to, to, to write. So going through the exercise of thinking up the name in advance can be really useful. Just in pinning down what it is you're doing, making sure that you know. And sometimes you'll, you'll actually change the direction that you're going in as a result of writing the name. Sometimes, to be frank, it is just uh, a pain point that's going to slow you down. If so, skip it completely because it's, you're probably still in that slightly exploratory phase. Um, right, no name at all or just a dummy name. Actually start a bit on the implementation until you think, ah, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. Remember to go back and add a good name once you know what it should be. Not for you there and then at this point, but for other people coming to read the code, which could be you in six months time, or even the next week, when you have no idea what you were thinking at the time. It's this name that's gonna say, right, this is what this test is all about. So really important, often overlooked. But obviously in this trivial example, it doesn't really uh, show you much because it's just a, a simple function. Uh, most tests are a bit more complicated than this. So let's look at a more complicated example. Here's a, a test for a most recently used list. So what is a most recently used list? Well, let's have a look at the test name and see what it tells us. It doesn't, but I don't know about you. I'm definitely guilty of this. When I come to write code for something like a most recently used list, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm writing most recently used list. That should be the test name. No, it shouldn't. It doesn't tell you anything. What actually is a most recently used list? What does that tell you about what the requirements are? What it is that's actually being tested here? Maybe something like, well, a most recently used list acts like a stack, except that duplicate entries are replaced at the top when you, when you push them on. So, well, let's just say that then. It could be quite a long name. That's fine if it captures the, the intention. Make it as succinct as you can while doing that but don't shorten it to the point that it becomes useless. This actually gives you a clue about what the test itself is going to be doing. Now, in this case, as a, a catch or catch two test, it has sections in as well. It's uh, these things here. If you haven't used catch before, uh, this may require a bit of explanation. A section is like a, um, a test case within a test case. So that first section, an empty list of elements, um, will be will be executed first and then it's going to skip over the second section and then 
re-enter the whole test case again from the beginning so it creates a new empty list skips over the first section and goes into the second section so each section is executed effectively in isolation as in isolation from the, the top of the, the function the top of the test case so it's like we've got two test cases in here they just have a shared path at the top in other frameworks you might express the same thing by using a fixture class and then test methods on that class and you have shared state as member variables of the class this mechanism allows you to use the stack for your shared state which is a bit more natural for c++ especially when you're working a lot with value types so i prefer this and it's hard to go back once you've, you've had it but maybe a bit odd the first time you see it that means if each section is like a nested test case that same rule applies it should have a good name that should tell you a bit more about what this particular part of the test is doing so an empty list has no elements that's an assertion about what should happen that you can then replicate in code so you have a, a natural language uh, description of what it is you're testing then you test it and then you have the code that implements it so you've still got three things saying the same thing in different ways and, and they all sort of hold each other to account. So make use of that. The other thing about these good names is depending on the, the problem domain, if it's something that's sort of heavily um, into some sort of business domain, for example, your test names may actually be readable to non-technical people, business analysts or customers or somebody else that you will discuss these things through with. And you can actually say, like, does this match the requirements? And we can have a conversation about it and that, I'm not going to get into that too much but that's really where um, BDD takes TDD and uh, pushes it off into um, I think they've got agile analysis and talking to business people it's much more about the the communication side of it this is your point of communication with other people maybe non-technical people so this naming is really important so don't skimp on it those names, again, should uh, state the expectations that's going to be tested in the, the test code itself. All right, that, that's the first part of good tests. The second one is that um, unit tests should have a regular structure. And what do I mean by that? So starting with that bit of shared code in this example, um, that's what we often refer to as the arrange phase. So we set up any um, initial state and you know, put things into you know, construct objects that sort of thing um, maybe optional you may not have anything set up think to that back to that add example earlier but if we have anything set up do that all here you'll then have again optionally it's not in the first section in the second section uh, an action something that you do so you set up the state and you do something with it perform an action the act phase in this case adding an item to the list and then finally you assert on the results of the action in this case it's um almost like side effects of the action uh, in other cases that are more functional like the add function it's going to be the return result it could be some combination of the two the point is the structure here arrange act assert a nice alliteration easy to remember and it might seem like well this is this is pretty much the only way you can write it but it's not quite true. Um, and in particular, you, you can get these out of order or repeat parts of it. And that's where it starts to break down. And we're going to um, come to that actually in the next bit. Um, which is, with the, the assert part, you may have heard this idea of having a single assert. Test should be a single assert. And then you, you have this extra qualification. That it's a logical assert what do we mean by all of that so let's go back to that example again in the first section we have two require macros so there are assertions two assertions but i've marked them up as single assert because it's a single logical assert they're both basically testing the same thing or aspects of the same um, state we've performed an action to verify that action did what you intended we might have to have several assertion uh, physical assertions it's like one logical compound assertion that it's in the state that you wanted. That's fine. That doesn't violate the single assert rule. But 
that second section. Because it's operating on an empty list, we could actually just let things follow on like this. We could assert our empty list. We could then add an item. And then we can assert that the list now has something in it. And you will see this in, in code. People do this because it's it seems convenient to just reuse state that you've already got into and already asserted on. But now, well, the second lot of asserts are in addition to the first lot of asserts. And you've got a dependency between the sections of your test. That's the problem. Because if one of these fails, it becomes much harder to pinpoint where it went wrong. And it's much harder to isolate a problem in one part of the code from a problem in the other and another part of the code. So you really need to separate these out. Now in this case, you might think, well actually where's the harm in that? Because we didn't perform an action at the start. We were just verifying that our empty list is what we expected. It's an empty list. And then we perform the action. It was going to be empty anyway. And yes, you, you may do in that particular case. And actually in, um, in catch, because you can have nested sections, you could represent it that way. You could assert on the empty list and then you could start a new nested section where you then go and add the item and assert the, um, the list with one item in it. That would be okay because now they're in separate sections, effectively separate test cases, nested test cases. If one of them fails, it will actually help you to pinpoint where it went wrong. You've still got a dependency there. If it's a necessary dependency, that's okay. Accidental dependencies, other things you want to avoid. So the single assert rule is, is actually more of a single act rule. I would say that might be a better way of phrasing it. And as part of the, the structure of the unit test, I think that's the more important part is making sure that you just have a single arrange act and assert, uh, at least logically speaking. And then the final aspect of good testing that I want to bring out is using the public interface. This is what came up in the questions in the first half. So I'll take a moment to talk about this. So what do I mean here? Well, I get this question a lot, as we just saw, it just came up. How do you test private methods? And I have a simple default answer. You don't. Don't test private uh, implementation. But then sometimes there's a follow up question. And the follow-up question is, but what if you really need to? And yes, there are some cases where it is actually valid to, to need to do this. Nine times out of 10, when I, this question is asked, it's, it's not actually necessary. It's just, well, I wanted to make it private. Um, I also want to test it. And the requirements haven't really been thought through, I think, at that point. The cases where it is valid to do it, broadly speaking, divide into two areas. One is if you're dealing with legacy code. And in TDD, we tend to define legacy code as code without tests or code with few tests. So if you've got the big mass of code with no tests and you want to try and get something under test, you're probably going to come up against this problem where you want to test private implementation and you're pretty much stuck with what you have. So you may need to use some techniques there. And the other broad category is what I call, and mentioned it before, non-functional requirements. Things that are not evident in the interface, but are nonetheless requirements that you have to somehow verify. So things like performance, um, maybe reference counting, uh, threads, caches, things like that, that they don't actually change the behavior of the code but how it behaves. So here's some techniques in order of preference. So probably the safest form, which, um, you know, it still does actually water down the safety, but of these options, it's probably the safest. And that's to declare a friend class in your uh, code that you want to expose the private implementation of. Make sure you put the word test or something very much tied to testing in the name. So like test access. And you'll, you'll see this pattern used a lot in Boost actually. So declare a friend, friend class. You only have to declare it, you don't actually have to implement it in the production code. In your test code, you can implement it. And that can then do whatever it needs to do to provide access to 
whatever it is you need to test, the reference count or whatever it is. Don't overdo it. Only provide access to what's strictly needed to be tested because this does break encapsulation. You will make the code a bit more brittle, more likely to, um, to break for unrelated reasons. So limit the scope of it as much as you can, but if you need to do it, this is the preferred way to do it. So as I say, you know, this is for testing non-functional requirements like reference counts, that sort of thing. The next option, which is sort of similar, but more at the linker level, is if you've got some function in a, uh, a CPP file, but it doesn't have a, a uh, signature in a, in a header file, so it's not meant to be used outside of that CPP file, just locally, but for some reason you need to test it. Well, just because it's not exposed in the header file doesn't mean you can't write your own um, sort of external signature for it in the test code. Again, it makes it more brittle, more likely to change from uh, break from related reasons. You can have other problems, like if the the optimizer strips out unused symbols, it may not even be available, um, that sort of thing. But it can be a technique you can use when you're stuck, if it works for you. And then there's the nuclear option. Do not use this unless there are no other options. And even then, think very carefully about it. Hash define private public. Yes, it can work. It can also horribly fail and often does. So really, please don't use this unless you absolutely have to. And I would say the only excuse for ever using this is in really, really tricky legacy code. I have used it um, in with legacy code before, transitionally, just to get me to a point where I can get things better under test and then refactored and only ever consider it a, a stopgap solution to get you to a point that you can use better ways of doing things. But Definitely the last option. The first option, of course, should be always use the public interface because that's the thing that expresses the behavior that are in your requirements. Other than those perhaps non-functional requirements, that's what you should be working with. Anything else is just implementation detail. That's not what you should be testing. If you're trying to test those things, it's just gonna to lead to very brittle tests that are gonna fail for reasons that are not related to your requirements. Sometimes it can be worth splitting out part of your private implementation into a separate class, say, that itself is public, so you can test it. It's got a surface area that you can test, but then it's a private part of the implementation of some other class. That can be useful, but now you've perhaps got a whole API that's not tied to your requirements. So it's still brittle, but at least you have clearly um, expressed your a low level API. So use the public interface is, the, is the, the main rule. They are the, the topics I want to cover here. Uh, in the two day course version of this, I go into about three or four more. Um, and that probably doesn't cover it at all. But it should be a starting point, give you some ideas. So I want to come back to the TDD cycle now. Um, and I also want to get back to hopefully a little second demo if I've got time. So I'll go through this quickly. What I want to cover here, something I alluded to in the first half, which is that it's actually more psychology than uh, a technical thing. And it's all about mindsets and different states, mental states that you go through. And you've probably noticed this, that the way you think if you're in, say, a uh, Say you're in a meeting talking about requirements and lots of um, high level pie in the sky stuff and doing whiteboard sessions. You've just got a different mental outlook on, on things than when you're down at the code face implementing stuff and getting lost in the code. Very different ways of working. And you may have noticed that you bring sort of different mental resources to the problem. You just solve things in different ways. You, you miss different things, you, you spot different things. Just because our our brains are these massive association machines that are all to do with like associations and connections with other related pieces of information and say mental resources. We can use that to our advantage. And the really nice thing about TDD is it gives you very clear, excuse me, very clear mental hooks for the transitions 
between these mental states. And perhaps more importantly, it actually effectively saves the everything you come up with in one state, saves it off so that you can you're freed to worry only about the next stage. What I mean by that is once you've written your failing test, uh, in fact, let's let's do the overlays actually. So when you're writing a failing test, you're thinking about high level design and requirements, user experience. What's it like to actually call your code from other code? And you're not worried about how it's implemented or whether it's clean or anything like that. That's your focus. But once you've written it, that's all that thinking has been captured in the test. The test will then tell you whether you've met that requirement or not. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You're pretty much freed from worrying about design and requirements and user experience when you get to the green stage. Now you can just become a hacker. You're just racing to get to the next green stage. Not, not worried about requirements, not worried about clean code still, just getting to green. Very single-minded focus, very different mental resources. And then you get to the refactor stage where, yeah, you're not worried about high-level designing requirements. You still got that test, keeping you honest. But now, rather than worrying about making the test pass, you're just worried about cleaning up the code, just keeping the test passing. But you, this is where you think about um, design principles, um, well-factored code, refactoring techniques, that sort of thing only. You can be very focused. And I think this is probably, for me, the most powerful aspect of TDD, the way it so cleanly lets you segment those different ways of thinking and not having to worry about the others while you're focused on one. And I, I don't see this talked about very much, so I think it's definitely worth emphasizing. So that's the, the TDD cycle again. The last section I want to get into, and so I'm not quite sure how long I've got, uh, what the, the end time is, so um, appropriate uh, that that's also a known unknown. Testing the, un the known unknowns, what am I talking about here? Um, in fact, actually, before I get into this, maybe I can stop and see if there's any questions on those first two sections, because this is a very different topic. Do we have any questions? Uh, there are no further questions. Okay, good. Uh, and while you're there, um, how much time do we have? Um, what do you think? How long will this section take? Um, as long as I've got, but maybe maybe 20, 30 minutes. Um, let's try for uh, past uh, 10 past. Okay. All we right. won't hard stop you, but like, this, yeah. is, this would be nice if you manage it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, now I have some known knowns. So in the first half, I talked about um, having a small set of tests as an artifact of doing TDD and deferring all the extra probing your unknown boundaries uh, to some other form of testing. These are the known unknowns I was talk I'm talking about. You know they're out there. You know that you want to test them somehow. You know that that example-based testing is not the best way to do it, but you don't know what they are. So known unknowns. How do you test them? To illustrate this, I want to do another little demo. And it's going to be for uh, the, the left pad uh, Carter. So you may remember a few years ago, left pad, the, the JavaScript library, made the news when, um, when it was pulled from NPM, the, uh, the JavaScript uh, pack manager, and half of the internet broke because it turned out they all depended on it. Uh, which is all a bit silly because it's just like such a simple little library. They just did this one little thing, which is to pad on the left of a string with spaces or some other character up to some defined pad length. That's it. Half the internet went down. So it was very simple. So it shouldn't take us too long to, to write some code for it. So let's have a look. Actually, having a look at the, the JavaScript tests um, tells us a bit more about how it works. And in fact, this is a good example. If I go back, sorry. The usage on the GitHub page doesn't tell us really everything about how to use it. Uh, but if you look at the, the tests, they actually give you a lot more 
examples, uh, including bad examples, of course. And most of these are because JavaScript's um, a loose type system. But that aside, you, you can actually read a lot more into the test. So test as documentation comes out of this as well. So we, we have a string, we have a pad length, and optionally an extra character, which is the, the pad character, otherwise it's a space. Um, if the pad length is less than the length of the input string, then you just get the input string back. Otherwise, you get the padding. That's it. That's our requirements. Oh, jumping ahead. What I actually want to do is come out of here and go to another C line instance, which is almost empty at the moment. We just got our starting test case, done all that part. That should be building. And we can start writing our requirements. Um, Again, you might have noticed a very bad test name. We're not going to worry about that here. What we are going to say is I want a function called leftpad, which will take a string. Um, we'll start with the simplest example, so like empty strings, zeros, that sort of thing, which tend to tease out um, edge cases you might otherwise overlook. So it's good to start with those. And we'll say, yeah, it's going to return an empty string. So of course, that doesn't compile. And now we can see C line working. It's got the red code because we don't have a left pad function. So let's write that. Probably wants to return a string. Uh, we know it wants to take a string. I shall set aside the whole discussion about whether we take a string by const ref or by value. We'll take it by value. And we want a, a pad size. So I'm going to use this string size type, not getting completion for some reason. So let's call it padded length. And we won't worry about the optional pad character for now, because it's optional. Now, what do we return? Well, by default, we'll probably be able to return an empty string. Trouble with that, if I build and run, is it passes first time. We want to start with a failing test. So either here or in the test, we just need to make a deliberate failure. Again, it seems counterintuitive. Why would you do that? We know it's wrong and it fails. Because now we know that the test is catching that. And we know that by making this change, we know exactly what's causing it to pass. We're validating our assumptions. So, all right, we've got a test. Let's write another one to try and force this to generalize a bit. Let's um, have a, an input string. So we would expect that to return the input string because the pad length is less than the length of the input string. So of course it fails because we haven't written the code for that yet. So now we can say, oh, I don't know, if um, padded length less than or equal to input string. I don't know why I'm not getting completions. Uh, oh, maybe because I haven't put length. No, that's because I haven't put it here. Then we can return the input string, because that's what we said. And that should pass. It does. Now, be careful here. We've written less than or equal to. We're only testing less than. We don't have a test for equal to, but it's passing. So what if I do less than instead? Hmm, still passes. We need to write a test that's going to tease out that part of the condition. So let's write something where the, the pad length is the same as the, the pad length we've got a failure. Now we know making that less than or equal instead of just less than is the thing that makes this test pass. Now typically I admit I would usually skip over that and go straight to less than or equal and if I think about it I'll write that extra test but if we're really doing this strictly we should probably try to make sure we catch that up front. So now we've got three tests that we've seen fail and then pass. Uh, what we haven't seen is anything actually padding the string yet, so let's 
find a simple example that works there. So empty input string, pad length of one, should return a single space. But of course, we're hitting this branch where we're only returning an empty string. So now we need to think about how we're going to pad the string. So now I know there's a constructor that will take a, um, a size and a character. I don't know about you, I can never remember which way round it is. So in fact, let's try it this way round first. Because it compiles, but it doesn't give us the, the result we expected. Uh, and I'm not sure that's for the reason I intended. Let's see if it actually works now. I may have missed something else. Nope, that was it. Usually it will give me a different um, error, but there we go. Um, okay, what, what else can we do? So what about if we have an input string and a, a pad length? Now we'd expect it to pad up to two characters, but we haven't written the code for that yet because it's just generating a string only. So what do we want here? We want padded length to be the final length, but we also want the string on the end. So we need to take that off of here. So padded length minus input string length, and then add the input string. And that should do it. It does. Now at this point, now I haven't written the bit about the um, the optional pad character yet. In fact, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. So I think the, the point here is I'm starting to struggle to think of more tests that I can write that will fail first time. Um, in fact, I'm doing this off the top of my head, I'll probably miss something. But yeah, at this point I'm thinking, well, Every test I think I can write here, I expect to pass. And I might add them as um, confidence tests, like, uh, I don't know, three characters here and seven there. That should give me four spaces and a string, and it passes. Great. Okay. And I could do a few more of those and maybe some more boundaries, but I'm pretty much done. But I know that I really want to give this a lot more testing. How can I find those unknown unknowns? I'm going to start a different test case here. And I'm going to call this um, left pad properties, if I can spell it. Which might give you a clue as to where I'm going, if you've heard of this before. Let's assume we've got an input string. And I'll, I'll give it some value, maybe something different this time. And we've also got a um, size type, a pad length. Uh, let's make it seven. Oh. Now, of course, I can. I can write more requires, they're going to be exactly the same as before, but what about if I think about what properties will hold no matter what these values are? So, assuming I don't know what these are, what can I say about them? Well, I could say that, oh, we actually need to make the call, sorry. Uh, output. So I'll pass in input string and padlin. So now I can say what well, output length is always going to be greater than or equal to the input string length. That should always be true. Let's uh, let's try that. Okay. Um, 
I can also say it's always going to be greater than or equal to the pad length. That works as well, of course. I might look at that and think, hmm, actually I might be able to generalize that a bit and say, more specifically, it should always be equal to the max of those two. Let's try that. And that works. I think that's good enough to supersede those two, so I'm just going to live with that one. We have to start being careful here. We're starting to go dangerously down the road of basically repeating the implementation in the test. Up to a point, I think it's okay. I'm okay with this, but I wouldn't go much further. But what else could we say? Well, we could say that the output string will always contain the entire input string. So we should be able to find it. Um, nope, it's not an iterator, it's npos, two colons, that's what happens when you're rushing. Okay, well, that, that's good, um, but I can actually be even more specific than that, it should always be at the end. So maybe I want to say not find um, yeah we want to actually say what that position is which should be uh, the length of the output string minus the length of the input string Sorry, output.length. That's what happens when you're not consistent. There we go. And that's true. Okay. All right, so I've, I've written these properties, but I've actually just tested them against these specific values. It'd be nice if we could I don't know, generate values here. Turns out we can. So catch has a feature called generators. So use the generate macro. Um, and then you can say um, random, because this is a an integer. Oh, well, let's say between, uh, I don't know, one and eight. That will generate random numbers between one and eight. Uh, continuously, so we actually just want to take the first, let's say 10 of them. You can compose these, a bit like ranges. Oh, you see the, the assertions jump up. Now 26 of them. Let's actually have a look. If I edit the configuration and pass in dash s, that will print out the results even for successes. We can see what's going on a bit more. Look, it's got all these different pad lengths generated randomly. We'll get to the strings in a minute, but um, that's what we haven't actually seen is the, the strings. So let's capture all our values. So it's another macro in catch that will basically write the values of these variables alongside their names into a buffer that only gets printed out in the case of a failure. Or, as we're doing here, uh, when we're, we're printing everything. All right, so now we see all of the values that went into that. Obviously the input string is staying the same. So let's change that. Do we have a generator for strings? We do as long as you're using my local development version. <laughs> this, had, this is not in the main uh, catch code base yet. So you can't use this today. Uh, hopefully this will get there. But let's just leave it like that. 
So strings is a random string generator. Let's have a look at what that's going to give us. So I'm still printing out everything. Randomly generated strings. Great. Most of them are quite long, so we're not actually seeing them pad much. But it's doing a lot of them. So we might need to fine tune this a bit. We were generating random numbers between 1 and 8 for the pad length. We can control the strings as well. Let's say we want a minimum length of 3 and a maximum length of 10. The default was 32 by the way. Okay now if we look around we should probably see some padded strings. There we go, there's one. So it seems to be doing a more interesting job. What about if we put those minimum numbers down to zeros? Oh, that's interesting. Now we get failures. What failures are we getting? Let's take that dash s off so we can just see those. I think I've proved the point now that it's giving us lots of, of data to play with. Right. Input string is empty. Input string is empty. Input string is empty. Of course, if we generate empty strings, minimum length is zero, we'll try to find the empty string. It's always going to be at position zero. What we want to do is find the last instance, so from the end. R find should do that. And there we go. If we run that a few times, yep, it's always passing, but we can also increase the number of strings and pad lengths we're testing. Oh, got a few more now. We could go higher if we want. Start to take a little bit longer to run, but look, we've got 20,000, no, 200,000 tests being run here. That's pretty good for a few lines of code. Now we're only testing a couple of properties. We could probably think of a few more. I'm going to leave it here for now, but this is at least a big step towards what we call property-based testing. So these are the properties. They are things that always hold, no matter what the inputs are. Variations on that might be, well, they only hold for a sub-range, but we can, we can filter those out. Because these properties can be quite hard to, to find, actually. Another thing you can do with this sort of framework that's not strictly property-based testing, but it just works really well, is, and I think this came up in the questions in the first half, if you have an existing, maybe slower implementation of something, let's say you've got a, an, an algorithm that's really simple to, to implement, but you want to do a really optimized version that's really complex, you can use the output of the simpler version to verify the output of the complicated, optimized version. If you know that you can rely on the, the simple version. Or maybe you've got an existing implementation of something that you're replacing. You can use that to verify the results of the new version. So you can use the same principle. You're not generating it randomly, but this is how you usually do it. Typically you take a hundred random things. Now say this is a big step towards property-based testing. A true property-based testing framework does one more thing, which is a process called shrinking. So with this process, once it's found a failure, uh, and let, let's say we're generating strings and maybe it, it finds a failure with a string that's 1K long. That could be really tedious to work with. So shrinking, once it's found a failure, we'll then carry on working and try to find the, the simplest or the smallest instance that fails. So maybe a much shorter string that's gonna be easier to work with. Catch doesn't do that yet. Uh, maybe that will come in the future. Um, in the meantime, if you really want a full property-based testing framework, there is one for C++ called Rapid Check. Um, there will be links to lots of um, references and articles, and, and that particular repo uh, I'll give you at the end, which will be quite shortly. That's what I want to talk about for now. So I'm going to come out of here and back to my... Slides, which are here, oops.
And in fact, this is my last slide. So just to wrap up, um, two links there. So levelofindirection.com is my website. If you go to slash refs slash tdcpp, the test driven C++ .html, that's the, the list of references and links that I mentioned. That's worth having. Um, the other link, uh, slash testing.html, which you can also get to from the menus. Um, if you're interested in me coming in to do TDD training, then you can find all the info there. But I think I'm going to have to wrap up and see if there are any final questions. Thank you. So, of course, thank you for this uh, amazing talk. And I think the chat is also very happy. Um, there are many questions coming in. Um, I would say the official end is at, uh, in six minutes. So maybe let's see how far we can okay. get in that time. Yeah. And of course, there's the after talk chat. So everyone that was uh, that we couldn't get to, um, please uh, join us there and feel free to ask a question. Um, Unless you're watching this on Twitch. Later. YouTube, shall I say. Oh, yes. I mean, you mean YouTube. I was confused. I was like, okay, let's go, go. Um, what are your thoughts on random tests and whether related or not on testing code with non deterministic outcomes? Right. It's an interesting question. And I don't know whether that was asked before I started doing the generators, because obviously we use random um, data. I think it was there. asked before. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't really cover that part of it, the non determinism. So it's a valid question still. I think I mentioned in the first half, our test should be deterministic. And what that really is referring to is making sure we always set up the same initial state and then you know, don't have side effects and things that are going to give us different results each time. Randomness obviously throws a wrench in that. But when it's randomizing the actual test input, or also the other thing you can do is randomize the test ordering, which can tease out other non-determinism and uh, you know, un hidden dependencies, um, so that's worth doing. The trouble comes when you want to reproduce a failure that you found, particularly if it's one that only shows up you know, once every six weeks in the build server. You're going to be able to reproduce that straight away and not wait another six weeks. So what generally happens, and, and this is what happens in, in Catch, and as far as I know, every other framework that takes this seriously at least, when you're dealing with random numbers, it will print out the random seed that it used to, to seed the pseudo random number generator and then gives you a facility to to seed that generator subsequently so next time you run it um, you use that seed and it should give you the same results one caveat to that is currently in C++ the way the random uh, number library is um, specified it's not required I believe to give you um, stable random number generation across different platforms or different um, even different versions of the same standard library not quite sure where the, the line is drawn actually but you could end up um, having different results say on a build server than on your own machine if things are not quite set up right so there is a proposal i believe uh, in the works for fixing that to make this a bit more useful and i did see that in in catch my co-maintainer, who's actually the main maintainer, Martin Horonowski, who also wrote that paper, has put a facility in catch to generate stable random numbers to, to give you a bit more control over it. So that's the caveat. But yeah, you want determinism, and you can get that even with random numbers if you um, expose and make controllable the, the random seed. Mm -hmm. the, the advantage to doing it that way for, for the generators in particular is every time you run it, because you're still only covering a subset of all the range. You may not find it straight away. Um, every time you run it, it's going to cover a different bit of that range. So over time, it's progressively covering more and more of the range of inputs. And even if it never gets there, hopefully it will eventually find a boundary you didn't think about, even if it's not straight away. OK, then maybe a follow-up question that hooks in nice and nicely to that topic. Um, would you add, as an explicit test, any failed random tests? As an explicit test, any failed so random tests? say one tests. pattern shows up that you didn't think of before, and then you add an explicit oh, test yes. that 
Right, right. Yeah, so if the the property-based testing shows up a new boundary that mm. you hadn't thought of, yeah, you should absolutely capture that in, a, in an example-based test. Uh, mm. Absolutely, yeah, good point. I didn't mention that. Because now you now it becomes a known known, um, and you you do ideally you put the test in for it before you fix it. Mm -hmm. So you, you go back to red test tells you when you're when you're green. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a question about how does the generate invoke this and the implementation details, but I think that's something um, the, that's we can talk left about that up afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So if you're curious to learn how does that magic with generate work. Um, please join us there. So yeah. it was wonderful having you, Phil. Um, also, yep, you chat, you. 100 people or more sure watch this talk. That's amazing. Um, so I wish everyone a uh, happy, um, uh, happy festivities and a happy new year. And let's see you in the after talk chat. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.